Hey folks, it's the Red, and welcome back to the Worst Player Ever Challenge, where I play through every mainline Mario game that tracks score and aim to become the worst ever at it by beating the game with the lowest score possible. Because with how often these games try to shower you with points, you'd have to be a special kind of bad at this game to finish with such a low score. And today, we are moving on to my all-time favorite 2D Mario game, Super Mario Bros. 3. Ah, uh, yes. This is the one that stands above the rest for me. Everything about it is perfect. The plethora of new power-ups, new set pieces, the graphical overhaul over its predecessors, the tight controls, superb level design. I just love everything about this game. It truly pushed the NES to its limits. I could probably go the whole video gushing about how great this game is, but now isn't the time for it. Now is the time to become the worst ever at it. Keeping with the same rule says before, we must keep the score counter as low as possible by avoiding anything that gives us points, including power-ups, coins, and defeating enemies. Although if there are ways to do this without adding to our score, that is perfectly acceptable. Losing lives is also acceptable if the situation calls for it, but we cannot game over. We must defeat Bowser and roll credits for this run to be successful. What else is noteworthy is that the two-player mode in this game allows a second player to join in the adventure as well, and even though both players take turns playing the game, they both share the same level progression, meaning that if player one clears a level, player two wouldn't have to play that level and can move on to the next one. This could be used to break the challenge by having one player clear all the levels while the other player just clears the last level for the lowest possible score. So, naturally, multiplayer will not be allowed in this since they do not share the same score. Sorry, Luigi, you're gonna have to sit this one out. Let's start up a one-player game and get this show on the road. World 1, Grassland. A traditional beginning for a Mario adventure. Onwards to 1-1. And, as you might expect, there are approximately no trouble spots to speak of in this level. Everything is nice and spaced out, plenty of places to jump to and from, so getting past all the enemies and coins is not an issue at all. Let's instead take this time to talk about the end of the level. It's different here. Back when Mario games were allowed to try something new every now and then, and not just be a flagpole at the end of the level. As soon as we touch this box, the level ends and we are given a card. If you get three in a row of that card, you get a bunch of extra lives, but that's not important. As soon as the level is cleared, a time bonus is awarded. 50 points per second. And of course, we can't finish with zero seconds, because that's going to get us killed. So, we'll finish each stage with one second, get 50 points, and let's move on. Once again, no problems with the next level. Mainly just jumping over Goombas and accounting for the sloped surfaces as we do so. I did momentarily forget that this note block had a superstar in it, so I had to carefully wait for a good time to let it bounce past me. And it wound up being kind of tricky to do so. Yeesh, that was too close. Another 50 points at the end, and we move on. We'll need to visit 1-3 next for a special item. The level itself features Boomerang Brothers, but they're not too much of a problem. There's also a couple of tricky jumps about halfway into the level where we have to jump between rows of coins and Paragoombas, but they're doable. But there was a pretty big problem I ran into in this level. To get to the secret in this level, we have to duck on this white platform here for a few seconds, and there's a red Koopa walking on it. We have to stand still and duck on this platform for about five uninterrupted seconds, and I tried standing on the very edge of the platform in order to squeeze every millisecond out of this that I could, but the Koopa here is just not going to make it easy for us. Something needs to be done about it. But unfortunately, stomping on it gives us 100 points, so we really need to avoid doing it that way. It didn't seem like there was anything I could do, though, but then, on a return visit, on a whim, it just didn't spawn in. I have no idea what I did or how it happened, but at least now we can duck on the platform and fall into the background. Excellent! Now we can just run straight to the end behind the black part of this background, and find ourselves inside a toad house, which gets us a magic whistle. This item will be key in getting us to the last world. And the best part about doing this? We cleared the stage without adding to our score. More levels like that, please! And now, for even more good news! We actually have the ability to make use of power-ups in this game, without adding to our score, provided that we use them on the map screen. And to do that, we just have to get them from toad houses. In this particular case, we need to get a super leaf. It doesn't matter which box you try from, you have a random chance of getting any item in any box. Look at this footage here, where I'm using a save state tr to try and get a super leaf. Every time I open the box, I wind up getting something different, so it's pretty much decided by RNG. 
So just keep retrying until Toad gives you what you want. Don't you dare hold out on me, you fungus! We can now go ahead and use our Super Leaf as we make our way into One Dash Fortress. This first fortress has some resemblances to the castle stages from the original Super Mario Bros., except this time we also have Roto Discs instead of Fire Bars. They're a little faster, but don't cover as much area. Dodging around all that, we eventually reach the last part of the room with a single question block and a Dry Bones. Here is where the next problem lies. We have to get a running start so that we can fly up and above this wall to reach another secret area. But this Dry Bones keeps making it so that we can't get up to full running speed without trying to jump over it. After a few minutes trying to do this, I then realized, oh yeah, I could probably just scroll it off screen. And sure enough, it was gone. And I had the room I needed to run, so up and over the wall we go, into the secret room where we find another magic whistle. We now have the means to reach World 8, but before we do that, we have one more thing we need to take care of here in World 1, so onward to 1-5. As soon as this level begins, we need to immediately jump to come out of the slide and avoid taking out these buzzy beetles climbing along the slope. They're trying their absolute hardest to make it out of here, and who are we to stop them? Not really any problem areas in this level either. All the enemies are pretty easy to avoid, the piranha plants don't seem to pose much of a threat, and it's an easy trek on the way to the goal for another 50 points. 1-6 is next, and we've got a little problem at the beginning. This third platform here has a Koopa walking on it, and coins directly above it. It didn't look like there was any way to avoid all these things when they're all so close to each other, and no room to fly over it either, so on a whim, I decided to try hitting the Koopa with my tail to see how many points it would be worth, and the answer was... nothing! I was shocked! A way to defeat enemies without adding to the score! I got the Koopa out of the way, then just hovered down to the lower platform without jumping to avoid the coins, and we're back in business. There was no major problems with the level after that, or at least not with the level itself. See, when I cleared the level and went back to the map screen, I had to roll the dice and hope that the Hammer Brothers on the map would move to the right towards the castle so I could get to the Toad House without having to fight it. Because if we engage with it, that's going to be points that we can't avoid. So, I went back to clear the stage again and hope that the Hammer Brothers would move the other way on the map screen, and... After a few tries, I got the RNG I was looking for, and was able to proceed to the Toad House. Inside, we can get ourselves a Fire Flower, which will be needed later. With that, we are done in World 1, so Magic Warp Whistle away! Using the whistle takes us to the Warp Zone, World 9 as marked on the map, but if we use the other whistle from within the Warp Zone, it takes us all the way to the bottom, allowing us to go directly to the last world in the game. I'm sure those kings of the other worlds will be just fine. Heh. <laughs> this is Darkland, the final world of the game, and we're headed into its first level, 8-Tank. And little did I realize just how bad of a time I was going to have here. I thought maybe this level would be just a simple matter of dodging cannonballs and stuff, and that it would be a breeze. But was I ever wrong? Ladies and gentlemen, behold the bane of my low-scoring attempts, ba bombs they walk around for a couple of seconds, stop and start flashing, and then explode. That on its own isn't the problem. If other bombs get caught in the explosion, it gets defeated and I get points for it, even though I didn't interact with them in any way. To prevent them from blowing each other up, I have to pick them up and toss them away before they explode. Basically, when a bomb stops moving, I have a window of about mm, one second, to jump over to it, pick it up, and toss it off screen before it blows up another enemy. And because there are so many of them, I'm having to put myself in harm's way for quite a while in order to pull all this off. And here, in this first part of the level, there are two bomb launchers facing each other. So that's twice the fun! This is, single-handedly, the hardest thing I've ever had to do in the Worst Player Ever Challenge so far, bar none. You wanna know? what I had to do to overcome this? Do you want to know the level of platforming dexterity necessary to accomplish this task? Well, here's how it went down from start to finish. I couldn't believe it, but I somehow made it past this section without adding to my score. I was so relieved to be past that and thought I'd finally be able to start playing this level normally. But guess what? On the next tank, the very next tank, 
another bomb launcher. There's only one this time, but that doesn't really make things much easier. I still have to worry about the bombs blowing each other up in such a small space. It's really hard to get down to pick up the ignited bomb without getting hit by the one being launched out of the cannon at the same time. But after more blood, sweat, and tears, we finally made it past the second tank as well. But guess what? It happens AGAIN shortly after! Similar to the previous setup, there was just one launcher, but a big jump was needed to kick them away. At this point, I am really getting annoyed with this level and all the bombs I've had to prevent from killing each other. But we had to do it yet again further up! This one wound up being even tougher because it's a bit too high to kick them completely off screen, so I had to settle for exploding them in mid-air in a few cases. Also, this weird glitch happened where I jumped on a bomb the moment that it came to a stop and it exploded immediately, and then the bombs that came in after it were giving me one-ups. That's really weird, but interesting nonetheless. But, of course, we were able to get through once again, albeit with plenty of good fortunes, but hey, I'll take it. But what I won't take is yet another bomb launcher setup. We're back to having two launchers again, and they're even more of a pain in the raccoon tail to get around here. There is so much to dodge around, and timing has to be super precise. I spent a good bit longer on this part than I did on any other part of the level. But part of that may be because I'm starting to get frustrated with this level and the amount of bomb juggling I'm having to do. We managed once more, and at this point, I am begging for the level to end. But no, we have another bomb launcher. But this time it fires at ground level with lots of space nearby, so knocking these ones away is still pretty tricky, but only easier relatively speaking. This is still quite difficult to execute. But finally, after safely disposing of all those bombs while avoiding getting shot in the face, we reach the end pipe. And inside, we will find a single Boomerang Brother. This stage will not end unless we defeat it, so these are unavoidable points. But get this, when you jump on it, it's worth 1,000 points. But when you hit it with your tail, it's only 100 points. Kind of odd score distribution, but that's why I wanted to hang on to the leaf for this level. We get a superstar for clearing the level and don't need to worry about a time bonus. With that, 8-Dash Tank is finally, and at long last, clear. Finally, progress can be made. I swear, if I see another bomb again in this game, it will be too soon. Oh. Oh no. So next up, we have 8-Dash Battleship, which from the map looks like it's in lava, but in the actual level, it's in some kind of brown liquid. Also, you can swim in it. So maybe it's like, muddy water? I don't know, that's not important though. Before entering this level, well, let's go ahead and equip our Fire Flower. We're going to be needing it for much of this world. This level plays out pretty similar to the last one, but this time with less bomb bomb shenanigans, thankfully. Most of what we'll be doing here is dodging rocky wrenches, the wrenches they throw, and cannonball fire. The first bomb bomb launcher comes pretty early in the level, and it's pretty simple to handle. Just need to throw a few of them off screen here without much to avoid at the same time. Now, after we come to the end of the first ship, we have the option to jump into the water, I think it's water anyway, and swim underneath the second ship. And while it's not entirely necessary, it does make avoiding the crossfire of the ship much easier. However, we can't really do that with the third ship, because eventually we come to another bomb launcher, and of course, they'll be taking each other out, if we're not there to stop them. So, we have to jump out of the water and play through the third ship properly. Once we reach the part with the bomb launcher, we've got rows of cannonballs to dodge around as we try to pick them up. And it's as tricky as it looks, especially considering some questionable hit detection. Luckily, only one bomb needed to be kicked away in order to prevent them from blowing each other up. But it was nonetheless quite difficult to pull this off, as usual. But we finally reached the pipe that takes us to the mini-boss, Boom Boom. Now, this is an enemy we have to defeat in order to clear the level, but the thing is, jumping on him is worth a thousand points. Then two thousand points, then four thousand points. This is completely unacceptable, but this is why we came here with fireballs. If we pelt him with five fireballs, he is instantly defeated with no points added to our score. So, I enter the pipe with ten seconds left, hit him with four fireballs, and then wait for the timer to read three seconds before hitting him with the final fireball, so that he can have the last two seconds to explode, and then we can clear the level with 50-point time bonus. 
Whew! That one went by a little more smoothly than expected, but as we take the warp pipe into the next area, we find ourselves with a set of optional levels to play through. We don't have to play any of them unless this hand randomly pops out and pulls us into it. With the favorable RNG, we could just move right past all three of them and move on to the airship. But let's take a look at each of these levels and see if they're possible. The first one is a sequence of the various bros enemies you find throughout the game, including Fire Brothers and the classic Hammer Brothers. But this is about as far into the level as I could get because Hammer Brothers in this game are quite aggressive with how many hammers they throw. I couldn't really get a clear jump to the top row without putting myself in major harm's way. This level might be clearable if the Hammer Brothers were in a better position, but I would avoid this one if at all possible. The second level is also quite difficult, but this one's actually doable. The only things that you really need to watch out for here are coins and lava bubbles. The coins are right in the middle of the optimal jumping path of this level, but with some carefully timed crouch jumps, you can pass underneath each set and reach the other end of the level, which is quite short. For reaching the end of this level, you are given a chest containing a super leaf. And since we are clearing the stage by opening a chest, that also means no points are added, so that's good. The third level is a cheap, cheap bridge level, similar to 2-3 or 7-3 from the original Super Mario Bros. This level is a threat at all times due to the possibility of a cheap cheap flying right under your feet and getting stomped for points. You might have to do some fancy dodging here and there, but otherwise this level can be cleared without adding to the score as well, and the prize once again is a super leaf. So with those out of the way, let's move on to the airship. And this one's another auto-scroller, but this one moves much faster than a standard airship. The only hazards really to watch out for are the rocky wrenches and fire shooters, which are usually over a pit anyway, so they're not too much of a threat either. The biggest challenge, of course, being the faster speeds that this level operates at. You'll also need to keep an eye out for stray wrenches flying across the screen, because they only move slightly faster than the screen is scrolling, which can keep them on screen a bit longer and make jumping around them more dangerous. But overall, I didn't have too much trouble with this one, so we reach the pipe, wait till 10 seconds, go down and take out another Boom Boom, finishing the level with another 50 points. Now, as we go down the next warp pipe, we find ourselves in the area for where the world gets its namesake, the Dark Area. And here is where we will find the first proper level of the world, 8-1. Took long enough to get to this point, huh? The first part of this level can be a little difficult. All the pipes we have to jump across have a piranha plant of some kind coming out of it, so we have to dodge fireballs and wait for them to retract before we can safely move across. Next up are some bill blasters in a large stack. Not too troublesome if we can get out of the area in a timely manner. This section has a low ceiling lined with coin blocks, so careful jumping is needed here, followed by a crouching slide to get under this low-hanging bill blaster. And then we've got a few tricky jumps right about here. Avoiding the Koopas, we have to bounce on a note block while running to clear this gap and reach the end. It might look simple, but the level is actually kind of tough. 50 points at the end, and then we can move on to 8-2. We don't want to play through this level properly because eventually we will be targeted by the Angry Sun, who will give us points if we finish the level with him on screen. So we need to sink into this quicksand at the beginning of the level and warp past it. Don't take the right pipe, because that's just going to lead to a room full of crushed hopes and dreams. Oof. So, let's go down the left pipe, avoid the one power-up block of this room, and continue up the hill past the point where the angry sun would spawn. Slide down the hill and get ready to bounce across these note blocks. The end of the level is just beyond here. Another 50 points, and that takes us to 8-Dash Fortress. This is a level that I thought was required to have a super leaf in order to progress, but actually, we can get through this without compromising our fireballs. This fortress is constantly having you change between two rooms by having the player enter through various doors, putting them in a relative part of the fortress. Some parts are lined with bricks, which would need to be cleared either by hitting them with a raccoon tail, or by hitting a P-switch and turning them into passable coins. But luckily, there is a route we can take to avoid just about all of it. In fact, the only points we need to take here are here in this first room. Go all the way to the end, and then there's a door surrounded by bricks. We need to take out this one brick block here for 10 points, then crouch jump up to the door. Entering this door puts us past a point where we would have to have a raccoon tail in order to continue. Jump across the lava, avoid the lava bubbles and the thwomp, and enter this door down here, then go through the next door after that, 
crouch under the spikes, and then get ready to make a tight jump over this pit. A few more hazards and enemies to get past, and we'll reach the end of the room. Hitting this brick will reveal a P-switch, and once activated, the door leading to the boss will appear. We can then go inside, but once again, we need to wait until the right time to begin the fight. We take out Boom Boom, get another 50 points, and the fortress is down. Dark section completed! So into the warp pipe we go, and we are in the final stretch of this world. All that stands between us and Bowser's castle is... Another tank level. Ugh. I still have horrible memories of the first tank level we played, but... It would seem good fortune is on our side once again, as this level is mostly just cannonball dodging once again. Instead of several smaller tanks like in the first one, most of this level consists of one long flat tank. There are a couple of bomb launchers in this level as well, and they're still the hardest part about the level, but they're manageable at least, provided that we have the right jump timing. Even more so here because of the mostly flat terrain that we're working with, which means we don't need to jump as high as we needed to before in order to get the bomb out of harm's way. Because of this, the level goes by much faster than the first one, and then we take out Boom Boom with the fireballs to clear the level for another 50 points. And just like that, we have found our way to the final level of the game! We no longer need the fireballs at this point, so I went ahead and switched over to the Super Leaf for this level in order to make the platforming a little easier. Right at the beginning, we have some running room which allows us to fly over the laser statues. No sense risking damage when we don't need to. For the most part, this level can be played as normal. We even have the ability to afford a few hits here and there if we need to. There's actually two ways that you can get to Bowser, but I opted to take the upper path in this large room, as it felt a little less risky. After some classic fireball dodging leading up to the final doorway, we finally reach Big Bad Bowser himself. Now, the reason I decided not to use fireballs here is because, as it turns out, unlike with Boom Boom, when Bowser goes down after you shoot him with 36 fireballs, yeah, this guy's kinda tanky, if you do that, he winds up being worth 100 points. This is on top of the 50 points you'll get for clearing the stage. Unfortunately, to make the score as low as possible, we need to get him to defeat himself, which means having him stomp away the red ground and into the pit below. This also means we need to enter the room at just the right time so that he stomps through it at just the right time so that we can finish with just one second for a time bonus, which is way easier said than done. The problem is, Bowser's attacks seem to be randomized. Sometimes he'll shoot two fireballs, and then he'll try and jump on you. Sometimes he'll throw one fire before jumping. And sometimes he'll throw the second fireball at the same time that he jumps. I couldn't find any kind of a consistent pattern in his movements, so all I could do was try to come into the fight with about 54 to 56 seconds left on the clock, and hope that I get the right RNG to close out the level with the right amount of time on the clock. After close to an hour of retries, I finally got him to go down at the right time. Honestly, it didn't feel like a proper victory because I was basically banking on good RNG in order to get the outcome I wanted. But I suppose there wasn't really anything else I could do if I truly wanted to be the worst ever. But regardless, with a score of 660 points, we are officially the worst player ever. All things considered, I was quite happy with how this run turned out. The only point scored outside of time bonuses was a Boomerang Brother at the end of 8-Dash Tank and a single brick in 8-Dash Fortress. Still, doesn't quite match the 600 points we achieved in Super Mario Brothers, but still pretty gosh darn close. Let's also take into consideration that Mario 1 only required 8 levels to be cleared, and this game required 14. And the difference in score is only 60 points. Who knows if it'll ever get that close again. Still, it felt like I was relying a lot on random elements to see me through this game, from the Koopa disappearing in 1-3, the Hammer Brothers moving out of the way of the Toad House, the Toad Houses themselves giving the right items, giant hands not pulling me into a level, and then Bowser's attacks at the end. To become the worst ever, the stars had to align in pretty much just the right way. Unless, of course, you rely on save states. But even then, still pretty tough challenge. And let's not forget to acknowledge the biggest troublemaker about this run, those freaking bombs! I seriously did not expect these things to give me as much of a headache as they did, but preventing these things from blowing each other up proved to be one of the most difficult things I have ever had to do in the Worst Player Ever Challenge. And looking back on it, I can barely believe I actually pulled it off! But at last, we are 
victorious. But for now, that's gonna be another game in the bag, and it's time to look ahead to the next one. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. And with any luck, we won't be dealing with any more of those bombs, right? Right?